Well, we're continuing our series in the book of Mark. We're um, doing actually 16 whole weeks uh, in the book. Last week we took a week off as it was Easter and we had a one-off uh, Easter message. Um, but in So we're going to be going into Mark 5. But in Mark, uh, the fourth chapter, uh, Jesus really was doing some amazing teaching where we looked at this parable of the sower and the seed and the different kinds of heart solo soils and it was just an amazing demonstration and passage of Jesus's um, teaching but then at the end of Mark chapter 4 there's an account of them going across uh, the lake and a storm coming and Jesus demonstrating his power by calming the storm in other words him displaying his power over the elements because when you see the life of Jesus he didn't only teach but he also demonstrated the kingdom of God and that he was God, he was God's son. And what could happen when he showed up, not only by showing us the way, but also demonstrating uh, who he was. And now when we switch over into the fifth chapter of Mark, it's gonna be about st stilling some storms again, but it's not the storms out there in the weather, it's the storms of the heart. And we're gonna look at three individuals who had s internal storms uh, in their life. The first was a guy demonized. I mean, he was completely overtaken by demons. We're gonna talk about what that means and what it doesn't mean a little bit. And then the second one was uh, the account of a, a, a ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, and his 12-year-old daughter who had become very sick to the point of death and then died and Jesus raised her up. And then the last one was um, uh, the account of a woman with an issue of blood who had had this uh, condition that had gone on for a long, long, uh, long time. So I'm gonna attempt something here. We normally have just a few verses of scriptures. Every now and again, we'll read a longer passage. And I, I know it's harder to sometimes tune in, right? Because um, we're in an age right now where, you know, we're bombarded social media. We can't help but pick up our phone about every like 30, you know, every few minutes and things like that. So sometimes it's harder to like pay attention to a longer passage of scripture reading, but I just believe you guys are so amazing uh, that you'll be able to actually follow about at least 20 verses at a time. So we're going to break it down into three. So we're not going to do the whole chapter at once, but I want to attempt to try to read uh, the whole chapter by the time we get done here, okay? So let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for your teaching. And now as we look into who you are as the Son of God and your power, we also um, ask that you would reveal to us your word and what it means to us and to our hearts and your kingdom and what it can mean to us, Lord, as we engage and we encounter you afresh and anew. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to start with Mark 5, verses 1 to 20. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gesserines, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying, Come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what, what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. 
as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Now, in Western civilization, the Western world, we're not as quick to acknowledge the realm of the spirit, the, the realm of angels, the realm of demons. Um, and I realize that, but that's not true around the world. I mean, if you, uh, for those of you who may have come from Africa, or are you familiar with that? There's much more of a willingness to understand, hey, the world isn't just this physical world that we see. There is more to it uh, uh, than that. And so when we look at the scripture, uh, it doesn't have a problem of painting a picture of that the physical world isn't all that there is, that there is a spiritual world. In fact, it, as we read the scripture, we see that the created world came from the spiritual world, that God had always existed, but this space-time continuum hasn't always, and it came from the spirit world that has been eternal. And when the, when the spiritual world breaks into the physical world, it can either come with God's blessing or it can come with an effect of what we would call evil or the demonic. Um, angels and demons, in Revelation 12, it said that about a third of the angels of heaven became demons. And so this spiritual world is around us whether we uh, care to acknowledge it uh, or not. But this text even shows the power of the supernatural dimension breaking in both in the sense of the supernatural strength that was on this man who had been a demon possessed. They talked about the supernatural strength of being able to break uh, shackles. But it also shows God's supernatural power coming through into this man and healing him and delivering him and getting his life, his life back. We see that demons seek to destroy. We see that when they enter the world, it's always destruction. When the demons went from the man into the pigs, what did the pigs do? The pigs basically all went and drowned. It, it, it's, it's as if what was the effect of the demons and the man? What did they want him to do? Well, I think that those demons ultimately, because they are to oppress and to take away, ultimately they wanted that man to commit suicide. Even though that he was in a very bad state, he still had enough of his own... Uh, aspects of being created in the image of God, that he was able to resist that. Even though he had lost his mind, he was still able to at least resist. And that's because the image of God in all of us is powerful no matter how marred it is. Jesus said that the enemy, the thief, comes to seek and steal and destroy, but Jesus said that he came to have, have light. It's also interesting that the man who was transformed by the spiritual power begged to be with Jesus, but the people begged for Jesus to go away. It was too much for them to handle. Interesting that to the person who was being delivered and being helped by the power of God, to him this was great news. I got my life back. But to those who saw it another way, they were afraid because they weren't ready to enter into what God has uh, uh, for them. Jesus sends this man to tell a story rather than come and be with him. I mean, this man was so excited about what Jesus had done for him that it was natural. Jesus, you know, take me with you. I just want to hang out with you. I see these other guys, they get to hang out with you. Sign me up. But it's interesting that Jesus said, no. no you've, got, you've got another destiny. You have something else that I have for you to fulfill. And it says here, that he, he was asked by Jesus, he said, you go, you, you go tell your story. You go tell your story. And it says here that uh, he actually went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Now the Decapolis, decades, actually ten cities that were originally set up under Alexander the Great. So about 300 years before Christ, Alexander, roughly, and when Alexander the Great then divided up his kingdom into four kingdoms, and one of the areas that w was set up was this, this area here. And so it was actually ten great cities. So you think that what was 
Jesus going to do with this, you know, former demon possessed man? Is it just, did did he want him just to sort of say, okay, um, you know, go ahead and tell your you know your old buddy or your old friend, you know, or whatever? It was it was much more than that. To be sent to the Decapolis was was a big thing. So I just researched a little bit about this, kind of brushing up. I wasn't a history major, so like I only know bits and pieces of uh, ancient history, but you know that's why we have Google. So, um, but just looking through, and I was amazed at. Uh, I got onto some um, tourism sites actually, and you can actually go visit these um, the, the ruins of the, these cities in the Decapolis, and I have a picture of just one of the ten cities. This is remaining today. It had a seven thousand seat coliseum in one of these cities. And you can go see it today. So think of this. This man would have gone to one to this city. I don't know. We, doesn't, we don't have any history. We don't have the history recorded in scripture. And I don't think there's other history. But perhaps this demon possessed man had an impact here uh, in, in this great city. Uh, Ammon uh, to be specific. The Lord took someone who was really troubled. And used him greatly. Let's go on to the next story, starting in verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was by the, beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and alive. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was getting no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The woman with, with the issue of blood. It was actually risky for her to even be in public because someone with... Uh, a disease like that in, under Jewish law was considered unclean to even be in public, let alone especially go to the synagogue or anything like that. The other thing that was risky in her life is that she did go to the doctors, but the problem is that she got worse instead of better. There's nothing worse for those of you who are involved in the medical field, or I guess you don't need to be in the medical field to know this, but I mean, if you go in for an operation, say, even if it's a simple one, and something goes wrong, and you come out worse than when you went, that's a terrible situation when that happens. And it does happen sometimes. It's rare, but it does happen. That's what happened to her. She paid money to doctors, and instead of getting better, got worse. Not only that, but the, the situation was so desperate, she said that she spent everything she had. It was like mortgage the house, sell the car, every, every you know, sell her jewelry, whatever she had. Well, she didn't have cars. They didn't have cars in those days. But just whatever, sell the donkey. And, uh, you know, whatever you have. They had jewelry back then. I do remember that. Uh, but so her situation was dire. It was extreme. It was risky for her to be out in public. But when you look at what she did, she took a chance. She took a risk. And I like to say that she had creative faith creative faith. There's no Bible verses or nothing that says this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to reach out and touch the hem of the garment of Jesus. Now it's historical. There's been many Christian hymns that have been you know, written about this and songs and things. But she was the one who just came up the idea with the idea, if I just touch the hem of his garment, 
I'll be healed. I probably can't get to him. I probably can't get him to come to my house. I probably can't. Any of them. But if I can just work my way through that crowd and somehow touch the hem of his garment, I believe that I will be, I believe I'll be healed. And when she did that, at that moment, there was a power exchange. Both her and Jesus knew it. She could feel that she had been healed and Jesus knew the power had gone out of him. See, that's when that's why his disciples is a big crowd, and he said, Who touched me? And they're like, Jesus, like, who didn't touch you? <laughs> like, you are working your way, if you've ever worked your way through a big crowd, you know, at a, going to a sports event or a concert or, you know, a mall on Boxing Day or Black Friday or something like that. I mean, you just know that you're just like, when you're in those situations. But, it wasn't that kind of touch. Not every touch is the same. This was a touch that was united by faith. And when she touched him, she knew she was healed. He knew that power went out. This is what Augustine said. Flesh presses. Faith touches. He can always distinguish between the jostle of a curious mob and the agonized touch of a needy soul. Isn't that beautiful? Instead of Jesus becoming unclean from the touch, she got healed. And now back to Jairus. Well, in verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw the commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child's not dead. She's sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. I guess being dead takes an idea. Um, it's interesting that this story was interrupted by the woman with the issue of blood. Do you notice that? It's like Jesus said to Jairus when he was asked to come and heal the daughter. The daughter had an acute she wasn't dead yet, but she was in an acute situation. Jesus said, yeah, I'll come, no problem. And then the woman with the issue of blood interrupted uh, Jesus going to the household of Jairus. But it's interesting. You can see that Jesus is in a hurry. Wasn't in a hurry. He flowed reading the moment and acting accordingly. And But it's highly unusual. Uh, if you go to an emergency room uh, and there's one person that, you know, by whoever's doing the you know, initial contact, the medical uh, staff says, you know, what's your problem? He said, well, I have this problem for 12 years. And then the other person says, you know, I'm 12 years old now, I'm at the point of death. Uh, which one are you going to treat first? Jesus, in a counterintuitive way, almost like malpractice, said, I think we'll take the one Let's look after the 12 year acute situation first. Look after that. We'll get, to, or chronic one, we'll get to the acute care in just a minute. I mean, in today's medical world, you would be charged with malpractice for doing something like that. But Jesus knew what was going on. He was displaying and demonstrating the kingdom of God. There was more to it than just following normal protocol. He came not just to teach, he came to demonstrate his power and the power of the kingdom of God. 
Then when the news was reported that she was dead, Jesus immediately replied in verse 36, Do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. Jesus practically protected the zone of faith by only taking into the house Peter, James, and John and the parents. Yes, the kingdom of God is about what Jesus does and about what God does. But there's also a protection, or I, I call it here, a zone of faith. And he only took three of his disciples, the parents, the little girl himself, so there was seven in the room. The people who were mocking and laughing, when he said, hey, she's not dead yet. I mean, she was, but in his mind, he was, because he's God, he's calling it sleeping. Is that all it is to him? And there's been times in my life where I've been around people that were in that zone of faith and together sharing that faith. And when you're in that zone, it's amazing how the kingdom of God tends to break out and break forth. And then there's other times where there's a mixture. It's like for every, every person trusting and standing on the promises of God, you've got someone pouring cold water on it. And that's why sometimes the direction is to put the cold water people out of the room and surround yourself with the people who are believing strongly in the promises of God. So, how should these stories impact us today? First of all, with Jesus, there is hope even in what seems like hopeless situations. I mean, these are three back-to-back -back stories all put into one chapter. I mean, you've got a guy, you know, who knows what we would call it today, severe mental illness and losing his mind, schizophrenic, who knows what. I mean, literally, the voice, he didn't even have his own voice anymore. He was cutting himself. He was living among tombs. This wouldn't be the type of guy you'd think, hey, the Greek, there's 10 Greco-Roman amazing cities that need to hear the gospel. I need to choose somebody to go there. That wouldn't be your thought. But that's the power of the kingdom. That's the power of Jesus. Jairus' daughter went from the point of death to death to a resurrection. The woman who had the chronic illness lasting 12 years. And what does that speak to us today? None of us wants to be in a desperate situation. But Jesus can get us through. Another way to say it, I heard someone say that everybody would love to see a miracle. No one just needs to be, wants to be in the place to need a miracle. But there comes time in all of our lives where your situation's gonna get desperate. Your situations may, probably won't be one of these three, but in your own sphere, in the way that your own sensing and in feeling it, you're gonna say, Lord, this seems overwhelming. This seems desperate. And these stories remind us that with Jesus, there is hope in even hopeless situations. Secondly, it's not the greatness of our faith, but faith in God's greatness. You know, think about the man who was demonized. He didn't really have many faculties left. He did have control over his body. And so at least he couldn't keep his clothes on. He couldn't stop cutting himself. His voice was the voice of evil. But he had enough control over his body to get his body over to Jesus, and that was the expression of his faith. Because it's not how big the faith is, it's the object of the faith, and that's Jesus. What about Jairus? 
his faith. He was a, it says he was a ruler of the synagogue. He was a respected man. Uh, he wasn't a part of the priest. The rulers of the synagogues were like the um, directors, be like the executive director of the synagogue. He wasn't a priest, but he ran it. And for him, his faith had to be exercised in humility. Here, I'm a ruler of a synagogue, but this rabbi, I've heard of him, and I recognize that he is what I need, and he humbled himself, and he went to him. And the woman, like I said before, she just had her, her creative faith, if I just go out and touch the, touch the hem of his garment. So each of them exercised their little faith in a, in a big God. Thirdly, God call, thirdly, God calls us to exercise our faith. Verse 34, Jesus said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. And commended her and let her know why all the other touches didn't result in healing. And then finally, God delights to reveal his power on our behalf. Jesus isn't intimidated by the most difficult of circumstances and situations. Uh, I've told this story a lot, but I've, um, we lived in Nashville a number of years, and then five, five and a half years ago, we moved to Toronto um, to minister here and for this church plant and believe in God for more church plants, more campuses. But a couple of years in, it was like, this is not what I expected this to be. And I could just feel in my own heart and soul, like losing altitude. And not only that, I can remember maybe not feeling demons, but I felt evil. And I could feel these voices saying to me, leave this city. Uh, go. You don't belong here. You're not wanted here. And I'm not a super mystical man, but I know when I hear the voice of evil. I, I had enough discernment to know that's not the Holy Spirit. And I just began to say, I don't know where come just that creative part of, I know that God has sent me here. And so I just began to walk around our living room one day, no one was home, and I just began to declare, I am here. Three words, I am here. I am here. I am here. And I just said it over and over again as a prayer. And that was my little expression of faith in that moment. And you know, just my, by my agreeing with God in that prayer, I could literally feel evil being pushed back. I could literally feel the force of the evil being moved back. And I'm here. And until God says it's time to transition, guess what? I'm here. And that's just one testimony. There's many ways I think that you can experience exercising your faith. So here's, here's the concluding thought as we close. Is there something that God is calling you to exercise your faith for? And that's as we do our closing song. I want you to just be thinking about that line. For some of you, you can identify, huh, I'm in a desperate, desperate situation right now. So yes, this is, this is easy. And for some of you, you might have to pray a little bit and just ask God, is there something that you are asking me to step out in faith in? Let's pray.